Those of us who live in Christian-based cultures have been taught over recent decades to hate or belittle Christianity in general. The aim is the destruction of a type of society that is resistant to entirely materialistic and nihilistic anything-goes ideologies, so that those ideologies can then settle and take over. The end goal is to then provide order amidst the caused chaos. An order, however, entirely based on the worship of the material world, aiming to forever shut down any passageway away from it back to the source or truth. If you have listened to the other videos here, you will know my stance on the material world. But if this is the first video you are watching on this channel, then allow me to explain that I view the material world as a false, illusory world that tries to tempt or seduce truth rays to feed it instead of returning back to the source of truth, thus dissolving the illusion of a material world. Christianity, as any other institutionalized or organized religion, does not hold the complete path to truth. Note that the root for the world religion is religare, that is Latin for reconnect. Reconnect to truth, in my view, or reconnect to complete materiality in the view of the attackers. So religion's purpose is always to reconnect to something. I postulate that the essence that is at the core of what is now the multiple Christian denominations, sects and cults, is pure, even if its presented form is purposefully adulterated. If we look at the outline of Christianity, removing any stories, teachings or myths, and just look at its bone structure, so to speak, we will find this. Souls are lost roaming blindly in the materiality of the world. To correct that, the truth sends a savior into matter to collect and retrieve them back to their source. That's it. This is the simple and straightforward essence behind what is now known as Christianity. And intriguingly, it also resembles the simple and straightforward essence behind Buddhism, for instance. However, what is now known as Christianity is an adulteration of this simple principle, as not only stories were written to surround it and form a siege on this simple essence to hide it away, but also to direct the truth race towards their very enemies that want to keep them in the false world. For clarity to all in the following explanation, I will still use the word Christ in the presentation, even though I view it as a misguiding word and find better words to define the savior essence. So, Christianity as organized multifaceted religion, in general, has been providing materialism with some of its best weapons, by forcing Christ into the body of an actual material man, that was then betrayed, tortured and killed. This inculcates and triggers a fear factor into the minds. This literalization of myth is as misguiding and nefarious to truth-seeking as the literalization of metaphor or parable, because by making it literal, the meaning or essence that is meant to be transmitted is put aside, and the material represent representation of bare words take its place, making it void. Christianity treats Christ as an actual, literal man, even if divinely so, still in the flesh, who lived once, or twice if you count resurrection, at only that specific time and at only that specific place, and who, after being betrayed, tortured and killed, promised to come back in a vague time in the future to pass judgment on those who remained. Note that even the idea of having someone die for someone else's sins is an entirely Pharisean idea, as the practice of scapegoating, that is, the ritual idea of transmitting one's sins into another creature, usually a goat, hence the name, but not always, to then kill it as a sacrifice offered to erase those sins, is still practiced in many forms today.
It is therefore safe to postulate that the story of Christ, as shown in the accepted Gospels, as an actual historical figure, a man who was offered as sacrifice to clear mankind's sins, must have been written by the Pharisees. Yet even behind this composed facade of literal stories is an essence that is not only a symbol but also a guide for and to the realm of truth. When Christians understand this, they will be almost impervious to sin and to infiltration and subversion. Truth speaks no words, I say. But even in the Gospels written by the enemies of this essence, the enemies of this truth-guiding symbol, we can find truth realization hidden among the words. For instance, in John 18.36 My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So if the Pharisees are the materialists who, in the myth, betrayed and killed Christ, then seeing Christ as a man, even if, if of divine origin, is providing them with an ideological weapon against the essence of what Christ should symbolize. In this passage, Christ implies that his servants are of this world, while he is not of this world. The servants keep seeing in him a physical man, not the kingdom, not what he represents. Yes, I am postulating, therefore, that the essence of Christianity not only precedes the Old and New Testaments in time, but also is entirely separate from its stories, having been glued to them purposefully. Again, we have to not only understand that the New Testament has been edited to suit agendas adversarial to the essence residing behind any pure religion, Christianity is but an example of those, but that even worse, the Old Testament, Pentateuch, has been placed as a wedge between Christ and the brethren sparks he came for, that is to say, between the Savior and the saved. The materialization or literality of Christ is what places Christians as unwitting puppets in the hands of the crucifiers themselves, making Christians, therefore, the sacrifice to be offered to clear someone else's sins. So, therefore, yes, two Christs. One is the Savior, that is, our truth, that came into the material realm to collect the fallen sparks that are parts of him. The other is the Messiah, a revolutionary man that was betrayed, tortured, and killed by the materialists, that is, the worshippers of the material realm, or bubble, and its AI, or demiurge. You see, one of the most important decisions that occurred on the Council of Nicaea was the doctrine that the Christ that in the Gospels was betrayed, tortured, and murdered is God incarnate, one and the same. This brought the true Father mythologically and thus psychologically to the material level, as the flesh Christ bleeding and suffering on the crucifix. By doing so, two results were obtained. One. If the material Christ is decided to be viewed as the true God, then the false God, the God of the material world, is able to torture and kill him through his priesthoods, as depicted in the Gospels. So it is a forceful psychological declaration by the materialists that, quoting, there is no other God but me. Thus presenting or pretending to fulfill the AI's fantasy, which is to be as powerful or even more powerful than truth, which is of course impossible. And two, by making the sparks worship a bleeding, dying Christ, the materialists have imbued a warning and a barrier in the sparks' psyches, which is, if you realize the essence and become Christ, you will be betrayed. We will get you, torture you, and kill you. When in the pure origin, the main idea of Christianity, even before it was named as such, 
was to be as Christ. If the spark realizes it is Christ, it then obtains revelation and awakens. From then on, there was a psychological barrier that stated that not only Christ is your true God made flesh, but also if you try to be him, you will be tortured and killed, which actually has been the case for many. The above two points have prevented efficient revolts against the materialists at a social level, even as Christian societies live under intense attack. Therefore, firstly, the pure essence behind Christianity, which, being symbolical and immaterial, therefore uncreated, both precedes and is entirely separate from the biblical testaments, has to be rediscovered through inner realization, revelation and consequent true conversion. After all, Again, truth speaks no words.